Welcome to APA's weekly webinar series, co-sponsored by the Center for Campus Fire Safety. My name is Billy Zydek, Standards and Codes Administrator for APA. Just a couple of housekeeping items before we get started. The webinar recording will be posted to APA webinar page later this afternoon. You will receive a follow-up email in a couple of days with a link to the webpage where all webinar recordings are housed, as well as a link to our upcoming webinars. We have webinars planned out through December 2020, and they are open for registration. It's my pleasure to announce that APA has a new app. It's called APA 365. It's available for download for both Android and Apple products. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Please type your questions in the chat box, and they will be answered in the order they are received. If we run out of time and we still have questions, Response will be sent directly to the person asking the question by our presenter. Professional Continuing Education Credits, AIACLU, and ICC Recertification Credits are being offered. For AIA certificates, please send an email to Billy, B-I-L-L-I-E, at APA.org with your membership number if you have not done so in the past. For ICC, CEUs, if you are a CCFS member, please email Kathy Tabor at ctabor at campusfiresafety.org for your certificate. At this time, it's my pleasure to turn this over to Kathy Tabor to tell you a little bit about CCFS and introduce our presenter for today. Kathy, take it away. Thank you, Billy. And thank you, thanks to all of you for joining today, and a special thanks to our presenter, Denise Pappas. Um, a little bit about the Center for Campus Fire Safety. We're a national nonprofit member based organization dedicated to campus fire safety since our beginnings in 1999. Um, we're governed by a 12 person board of directors and they're located all across the country. Uh, the majority of our board members are fire marshals on college campuses fire safety educators, inspectors, and then the other board member, some board members are international industry leaders as well. Um, I, I always say we're fortunate enough, enough to have a leadership team made up of known and respected leaders in the area of campus fire safety. Some of our activities include training programs for campus fire and life safety officials and emergency responders, premier events such as our annual Campus Fire Forum, Campus Fire Safety Month activities, and of course our webinars. Um, as far as the forum this year, unfortunately, we had to postpone it until 2021, but we're still planning the same um, celebration of how far the Seton, some of the Seton Hall fire survivors have come over the last 20 years with Sean and Alvaro and how far the codes and standards have also progressed since that fatal fire. As a member uh, benefit organization, we offer free webinars and CEUs, discounts for training, access to an online job board, and listserv discussions for networking, a library of resources, a free e-magazine, and, and much, much more. Check us out at um, myccfs.org. And now I want to welcome our presenter, Denise Pappas. Denise is the Executive Director, Technical Standards Expert for Valcom. She actually works on the leadership teams for both Valcom and the recently acquired Caltron. Denise has extensive experience in the fire alarm and telecommunication industries. Prior to Valcom, she was a national sales manager for Commercial Products Group at Harrington Signal. Denise participates in a wide variety of fire, life safety, and emergency communication code committees, including the Intelligent, Intelligent Building Systems, NFPA 72 Chapter 24 Emergency Communication Systems, and NFPA 101 and 5000 Life Safety Code. Denise also works on several ICC committees and is the Communications and Systems Chair for NEMA 3SB. 
Denise studied communications at Bowling Green State University, and she is a certified speaker and a very experienced presenter. And at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Denise. Take it away. Thank you, Kathy and Billy, and welcome, everyone. I'm thrilled to have you join us today as we are going to talk about the NFPA 72 code changes that address cybersecurity. But first, let's go over a few basics. Here's a few things that I am not. I am not speaking on behalf of NFPA. I am not the NEC. I am not NEMA, although I'm one of the representatives for the NEMA organization. I'm not an AHJ. And yes, they can be crazy, but we love them. I am not the smartest person here today, but I do know a few things that I'd like to share with you. I reserve the right to revise and extend my comments, and you can ask questions. Just don't ask so many that you annoy everyone else. These are things I'm not, but one thing I am is fabulous. At the end of this presentation, I hope that you have learned at least one new thing. While we have some objectives to hit today, this presentation is meant to be a high-level overview of cybersecurity and how it evolved to be included in the code. Or did it? Does NFPA 72 actually address cybersecurity? Where do you find references in the code? And probably the biggest thing you want to know is how can I apply this knowledge to my specific campus or facility? Now today, I am bringing this presentation on behalf of NEMA, which is the National Electrical Manufacturers Association. The NEMA organization includes every type of electrical manufacturer that you can imagine. However, the most important one to the fire and life safety industry is NEMA 3SB, the Fire, Life Safety, Security, and Emergency Communications section. This section encompasses many of your fire and life safety manufacturers who work collectively to make the entire industry safer through the promotion of unifying codes and standards. Now, within the NEMA organization, there is a newly formed NEMA Cybersecurity Council that I am an active member. Our mission, to develop and promote cybersecurity standards, best practices, and sound government policies for electrical and medical imaging equipment to enable the full value of smart, connected, and IoT devices by developing, recommending, and promoting voluntary industry consensus standards, guidelines, and other technical work projects, providing a collective industry voice on legislative and regulatory matters, encouraging an open dialogue and collaboration with end users representing the markets that our member companies sell products and systems into, partnering and collaborating with government and nonprofit organizations involved in cybersecurity activities, serving as a coordinating review body for NEMA division, section, or council-specific cybersecurity activities. NEMA develops and maintains technical documents that promote industry-specific cybersecurity best practices, including NEMA CPSP 1-205, which is the Supply Chain Best Practices. These are the supply chain best practices and guidelines for manufacturers to implement during product development to minimize the possibility of bugs, malware, viruses, and other exploits that negatively, negatively impact product operation. We've got NEMA CPSP 2-2018, which is the cyber hygiene best practices for manufacturers. It's the industry's best practices and guidelines to improve cybersecurity sophistication in manufacturing facilities and engineering processes. And we also have our NEMA CPSP 3-2019. It is the cyber hygiene best practices for end users. It's the industry best practices and guidelines for electrical and medical imaging manufacturers customers to raise their level of cybersecurity sophistication as they utilize connected equipment. NEMA advocates for reasonable and flexible cybersecurity and, and data privacy policies at the federal and state levels. NEMA has testified in front of Congress, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, and state legislatures to promote NEMA members' positions in legislation and regulations. NEMA has successfully blocked overly burdensome federal reg legislation. 
I'm part of NEMA. We work with the U.S. Ener Department of Energy in the Office of Cybersecurity, Energy Security, and Emergency Response, known as THESRA. According to the Department of National Intelligence 2019 Worldwide Threat Assessment Report, several adversarial countries have the ability to launch cyber attacks that cause localized, temporary, disruptive effects on critical infrastructure, such as a disruption of a natural gas pipeline for days to weeks or the disruption of our electrical distribution network for at least a few hours. And some are mapping, and some are mapping our critical infrastructure with the long-term goal of being able to cause substantial damage to our United States. For this reason, the Cessor's vision is to secure the energy infrastructure for the nation. Their mission is to improve the security of the United States energy infrastructure against all hazards via cybersecurity, infrastructure security, and energy restoration and innovation research and development. CESPR provides continuous all hazardous monitoring, situational reporting, SSA coordination, and emergency response efforts. Now, one thing that's important to note is the NFPA 72 standards development process. For the NFPA 70, the NFPA 2022 code cycle, we have completed step one in the standards development process. We are right now between steps two and three. We have balloting from the technical committees that has not been complete, but when those are complete, the changes are submitted to the correlating committee. So, well, they coordinate things. So, for instance, if the technical committee on Chapter 24, Emergency Communication Systems, added a new requirement that would affect the Fundamentals Committee, there has to be a way to cross-reference them so they don't cancel each other out or have contradictory information. So we are so, so close, yet so far from our next edition of NFPA 72. One thing to note is I just found out this week with the cybersecurity that things may go in and they may not go in, and that's, that's what that's the chances we take. So let's go on. The terms that you might want to know, cybersecurity, it's the state of being protected against the criminal or unauthorized use of electronic data or the measures taken to achieve this. As an example, you lock your doors to your house and close your windows so those trying to harm you can't get into your house and cause damage, just like you do with your data. Proprietary, one that possesses, owns, or holds exclusive right to something specifically. In relation to fire alarm, fire alarm and life safety, most manufacturer systems are proprietary and work with their own brands of notification and initiation devices to protect their market shares. Open architecture. Open architecture means an architecture whose specifications are public. This includes officially approved standards as well as privately designed architectures whose specifications are made public by the designers. The opposite of open is closed or proprietary. Encryption. In cryptography, encryption is the process of encoding information. This process converts the original representation of the information, known as plain text, into an alternative form known as ciphertext. Ideally, only authorized parties can decipher a ciphertext back to plain text and access the original information. Encryption does not itself prevent interference, but denies the intelligible content to a would-be interceptor or a hacker. For technical reasons, an encryption scheme usually uses a pseudo-random encryption key generated by an algorithm. It is possible to decrypt the message without possessing the key, but for a well-designed encryption scheme, considerable computational resources and skills are required. Now, I told you that we're in the code cycle, and this was one of the proposed languages that's why it's underlined, this is what it appears to be, that they were going to submit for cybersecurity to be included in the next edition of NFPA 72. And it reads, cybersecurity, the protection of systems from theft or damage of data or damage to hardware or software, as well as from unauthorized command or control or access to any information of any services the systems provide. Now, 
NFPA requirements have historically been reliability, redundancy, reliability, survivability, but I'm adding in hackability. With redundancy, your system needs to be redundant. With reliability, you always want a reliable system. So basically your fire and life safety system works when you need it to be consistent each and every time. Survivability, when part of the system is under duress, you want to make sure that the rest of the system will survive to allow occupants to evacuate or relocate as necessary. In 2007, the beginning of Chapter 24, Emergency Communication Systems, began the introduction of mass notification with fire and life safety systems. This change prompted the changing of the name of the code to the National Fire Alarm and Signaling Code. It's about this time that people were introducing IP-based mass notification systems. My, how things have changed in just a few short years. Now, when you're talking about cybersecurity, there are three different types of communication pathways that they use. Ethernet, Internet, Mesh Radio, and Cellular. So, what is the difference between Ethernet and Internet? The difference between Internet and Ethernet is that the Internet is a wide area network, or a, a WAN, while the Ethernet is a local area network, which is a LAN. Internet is a worldwide large network that connects a large number of devices around the world, while Ethernet is a network that covers a small geographical area. When we're talking about radios, a radio access network, sometimes referred to as a RAN, is a technology that connects individual devices to other parts of the network through radio connections, requires frequency coordination to reduce potential interference, and requires FCC licensing. A cellular network or mobile network, as you all may be aware of, is a communication network where the last link is wireless. The network is distributed over land areas called cells, each served by at least one fixed location transceiver, but more normally three cell sites or a base transceiver station. These base stations provide the cell with the network coverage, which can be used for transmission of voice data, and other types of content. A cell typically uses a different set of frequencies from neighboring cells to avoid interference and provide guaranteed service quality within each cell. What's it important to note? Each of these technologies can be hacked. Signaling communications have evolved over the years, slowly from coded signals in the 1800s to the public system telephone network in the 1900s and then exponentially with the use of fiber optics to cellular and IP communications at the turn of the century. So we went from wired systems, as you see with coded signals, direct wires, telephones, fiber optic, to wireless. Wired systems had their own inherent issues. What happened if someone accidentally cut the wires? If you happened to be in the Atlanta airport during new construction, you would have had the first-hand knowledge of what happens when someone cuts wires. All the powers were lost and you were down and out. Then the advancement to wireless communications and with it, their own inherent issues. What happens if they get hacked? Your service is interrupted. Well, what do you do then? As communication pathways advance, they brought the world together for better and also sometimes for worse. As we continue to evolve and technologies continue to be developed, who knows what great discoveries can be made in the future? One thing for certain in the fire and life safety world is that we will continue to always keep lives, businesses, and property safe. Speaking of codes and standards, sometimes they can make things a bit more complicated and difficult to manage. There are many challenges to overcome when working with any fire and life safety project. While you may have the Life Safety Code NFPA 101, NFPA 72, state, local, and even campus-specific regulations to consider when you're putting your fire alarm management projects together. Technology is continuing to advance. If I could use the cell phone as an example, it started out as a bag phone. Do you remember that? It was in your car. I was a young lady right out of college. I thought I was so cool with my cell phone and that bag phone. They didn't have unlimited talk plans then, and my first bill was over $1,300. But the only thing I could do with that phone is make and receive calls. 
Then we move to the flip phones. Do you remember that? And if you were fortunate enough, you could take a grainy little picture. And how cool is that? Then we went to Blackberries, where you could literally start to check your email. To our smartphones today, where with one swipe, you can be connected around the world instantaneously. Isn't it amazing that all these technologies that continue to advance? Now, I will let you know, in NFPA 72, they don't limit you on your technology. But the challenge is, you have to get sign off with the AHJ on any of those. NFPA 72 codes have a set cycle. It's a three year cycle. With cybersecurity, it didn't get into the 2019 code, and we're trying to put it into the 2022 code. But it's a set cycle. It has to go through the process that we went over at the very beginning of this particular one. The other issue we have is that you have to have adoption by your local and state agencies, and they don't always adopt the code as it immediately comes out. So for instance, in Hawaii, I think in 2019, the most current edition of NFPA 72 is 2019. Well, Hawaii's on the 2013 code. So that's another issue you have to be aware of. But there's a need for cybersecurity. We wanna make sure that things are secure and when we're sending them, especially because it's a fire and life safety industry, we can't afford to have those systems go down. And that was one of the biggest things in this code is that we addressed it. From an insider's perspective, I will tell you that in the 2019 code, cybersecurity did come up. I was appointed as a task group chair on chapter 24 to address cybersecurity. How are we going to address this? And then I went to the new chapter 11, which is cybersecurity. But again, everything has to be voted on. If you were around last century and in the fire alarm world, you may remember the uproar the industry underwent when they introduced the addressable panels. Nobody wanted to trust them, much like the newer technologies and, that we have today. I've served on the technical committee of Chapter 24 since its inception in 2007, to which I still serve on that committee today. Wow, the amount of time that we have spent arguing about how reliable certain emerging technologies were was nauseating at best. I honestly thought we would never finish that chapter in time to be avail, unveiled in 2010. That's 10 years ago already. Technology continues to advance at a very rapid pace. With all this advancement, it creates such a challenge for NFPA. I wish that I could tell you everything that you need to know about cybersecurity in relation to NFPA 72. However, the truth is that even with all the technological advances that have been made, there is still a great deal of controversy among adding cybersecurity into the code. The ballots are not in yet, the correlating committee hasn't reviewed them yet, and the truth is that some people are just not comfortable adding anything about cybersecurity into the code. This issue was carried over from the last code cycle. Let's face it, we all know that cybersecurity is important, right? For instance, did you know that the world's largest bank got hacked? Now, how'd they do it? Through a digital thermometer on the fish tank in their lobby. Who would have thought? Right now, we are in our second draft currently in ballot. I can't say for certain that cybersecurity will actually get into the code this cycle this time, because I found out Tuesday it may not pass. So that's the challenge with cybersecurity being even addressed in NFPA 72 at this moment. But I'm going to share with you that in the 2022 edition, some of those proposals that were made in NFPA 72. First of all, Chapter 10, which is fundamentals, had cybersecurity requirements. It's just where required by other governing laws, codes, or standards, systems shall be protected by cybersecurity requirements. That's where it all started. It's underlined because that's what was proposed language. In chapter 24, our chapter decided that where identified by the risk analysis or required by federal, state, or local regulation or the AHJ, Systems shall be designed, installed, and maintained in accordance with cybersecurity standards. See the asterisk? That refers you back to Annex A. 
And in there, these are the standards. I'm going to let it sit here for just a second because if you wanted to write any of these down, you can grab them real quick if you want to take a note. These are the cybersecurity standards that we decided in, to include. One thing that's really important to know is we didn't want to make this overly burdensome for anybody. AHJs, end users, those designers and installers and engineers to be overwhelmed with cybersecurity with everything else they have going on. So we refer to existing standards that are already in place. Chapter 26, they did much the same thing. And that this was kind of a trend in the NFPA 72 committees this year, was to refer everything back in accordance with 10.5, which actually we decided to put a proposal forth as Chapter 11 and Annex J. As the evolution in the codes to add NAS notification and IP-based systems, it seems pertinent to have cybersecurity measures in place to address these multiple systems that are, being, that are being combined on the same infrastructure. The convergence of systems almost screams for cybersecurity to be addressed. What I would like to share with you is that the challenge is to ensure that their cybersecurity in your systems are solid while maintaining maximum performance. So one of the goals of cybersecurity is to provide secure, reliable, and fast alarm signaling and keeping that information and the data secure and intact at all times, 24 seven. Some things that you should consider is what's your existing infrastructure like? Is it solid? Now I know probably most of you are not IT professionals, but you would like to work with your IT team. Does your fire alarm team have an IT expert on file or on staff? Or do you have to work with your IT department? Are there firewalls? Ask them what kind of firewalls do you have? If you think about cybersecurity, think of it this way. If you're multi-layering to keep warm, so the days are getting colder and you're gonna keep layering your clothes on, why do you do that? To protect yourself. That's what you do with cybersecurity firewalls. You keep putting layers on to protect yourself and protect your data. There's software limitations. What can your software do? Probably the most and easiest thing to do is passwords and privileges. Now that could be you're going to have want somebody that has open passwords and they have all types of privileges. If that's someone that needs to manipulate data, you want them to have the highest level of privileges available. But you always have those people that just want to look at stuff and they, they think they might want to change things, but you want to protect that information. So you want to put those privileges in place so that so one person that's just going on to look and see what's going on can't actually change anything. So that's probably the, one of the biggest things that you can do is your passwords and privileges. How do I apply some of this knowledge? What, what should I really do? Like, you're like, hey, Denise, I got the cybersecurity stuff, but I don't really understand. Like, what can I do to kind of help up my game here? One of the first things you can do is have dedicated computers for your fire alarm systems. What does that mean? You have your software that's running on your computer for your fire alarm system. Do you really want somebody out there playing solitaire? Or do you want a connection so somebody can be checking their Facebook when they really should be paying attention to their fire alarm system? You don't really want people on Facebook if they're supposed to be watching your fire and life safety system. Encryption, we briefly talked about that. The industry standard is 256-bit encryption. So that means, um, and there's blockchain in there as well. Blockchain is a distributed general ledger system. So it has, it's set in packets and the packets are reassembled on the other end. That's one of a big way to keep protection is with blockchain. Appropriate firewalls, that's what you're gonna have to check. People are gonna have to keep checking at each level. Can I get in? Can I get in? Can I get in? Keep knocking to see. And the more firewalls you have, the better off and more secure your system's gonna be. Proprietary architecture, you wanna make sure that that is just what you have. You want limited access via the internet. That's what I just said. You don't want people on there checking their Facebook or doing LinkedIn or any other, anything else that should be strictly for your fire and life safety system. Isolate it from outside sources. Don't let outside sources get in. That's kind of going back to locking your doors at your house. You don't want to do it you're gonna control who gets in there. Use a VPN, a virtual private network for remote connections. That's one of the most secure things that you can do as far as cybersecurity. 
I told at the beginning I'm representing NEMA, but I also am the executive director at Caltron. Caltron's been around for 50 plus years in the fire and life safety industry. One of our biggest thing is take disparate systems and connect them together. We're a member of NFPA 72 Chapter 26 committees. We were bought in 2018 by the owner of Valcom. And Valcom is an IP-based mass notification system. We have a full software engineering, hardware engineering, and cybersecurity is extremely important to us, and we take it very seriously. We're a unique retrofit capability to ease the transition from your legacy. We talked about the wire technologies to the newer technologies. So what does Caltron Systems do? You have campuses that have been built over the years, and they, I bet they all have the same fire alarm panel, don't they? Well, we know that's not true. And the challenge is trying to take all of those fire panel brands and put them into a single system. And that's what Keltron does. And we do it with multiple alarm signaling technologies. And we put it into a single view so that you can have situational awareness at all times. You know what's going on in any fire building or across your campus in one view. What does the future hold? I was really hoping today I would have some solid concrete things that I could bring to you from NFPA 72 to say this is the absolute thing that's going to happen. Chapter 11 in Annex J may make it into the 2022 code or it may not. It's not looking so promising at the current moment, but what I can tell you is I will keep trying to address this issue now and into the future. Some of the new solutions at Caltron is our LSNet 9000 IP transceiver. It says IP with cellular backup. We're into the digital age of apps. We have our LS50 mobile app that increases facility-wide situational awareness. And we have a shake alert system. That's the early warning system for earthquakes. You would know what 30 seconds can do will make a big difference to you in the face of an earthquake coming. Thank you so much for your attention today. I know that everybody's busy, and if we have any questions, I'll be ready to answer them. Thank you so much, Denise. That was great. And yes, we do have some questions. Um, and the first one is, why aren't the cybersecurity guidelines in the code already? Well, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> There's a lot of different um, perspectives on that, Kathy, and thank you to the person that asked that. We keep trying to put them in. We've tried for four or five years now, and this is the second code cycle that it may or may not make it. And I think the biggest concern from an overall perspective is they didn't want to burden the NFPA 72 code with additional requirements and regulations. It's kind of hard on the AHJs because they have so much to know already and the engineers, this is one more layer of stuff that they've got to worry about and address. And I think that's really probably the biggest key. And when we approached this, we wanted to put some framework in. It was not a large chapter, it was never meant to be. And during the presentation, I referred you back to our annex, which talked about the three or four different documents that currently exist. And so I think it will um, I think it will be in the future. I'm hoping for 2022. If not, it may be 2025. Wow. Okay, next question. Um, you mentioned multiple signaling technologies. How do Caltron systems prevent hacking? Well, our systems were designed with hackability in mind. And what we do is we keep our information completely isolated from the outside world. So outside information can't get in. So I kind of use the, the example of someone's knocking on the door. If you don't want that person in, you don't have to open your door. That's what we do with Caltron. We're looking for specific information in a specific format. And if they don't have that secret, secret, super secret knock, or super secret code with information, we just leave them outside. Okay. Um, I still have three more questions. Okay. Um, are, there, are there fire alarm manufacturers that you know of that are getting in front of the cybersecurity protection concerns? I, it actually, 
actually, um, I, I work with a lot of uh, the people on the codes and standards from those different, the major fire alarm manufacturers. And I can, I can say with certainty that all of them are concerned with cybersecurity, especially with their networking. So that is something that every single, it's an inherent thing that any manufacturer right now is working with hackability in mind. They don't want their systems hacked because you know what's going to happen. Nobody wants that public relations nightmare. Right. Okay, this one. Um, are there any estimates for expected costs to comply with cybersecurity standards? I agree with the need of protecting the infrastructure of the fire alarm system. In this day, where we have to worry about threats internal and external, the quickest way to create havoc when there is ill intention is to dispute the activation of alarms in order to cause harm. So I think the question part of that is, are there any estimates for expected costs to comply with cybersecurity standards? Um, that's probably that's a question I just can't address because I'm not sure. What I can say is that every single manufacturer out there designs their systems with hackability in mind, and so they're trying to make their their systems as secure as possible. I don't know about the the financial burden because I would think that that would be an inherent cost of manufacturing, but to actually do the implement the the integration that's required, I, I can't honestly answer that. I, I, the answer is I just don't know. Okay. Um, is there any plans or are there any plans for standardizing the fire alarm control panel display and interface panel? You know, um, I don't know that there is any plans of that um, right now or in the future. I would say probably not because I would think every manufacturer wants to kind of protect their branding. I will tell you though, however, with Keltron, when we bring all those panels together into one view, it is consistent view each and every time from a dispatching and monitoring view. That's one thing that we can do already that Valcom is very equipped to do. Okay, let me just take one more look. There's a, um, a comment from one of the members of our board, um, and she, what she's saying is possibly connecting with cybersecurity experts on your committee will help to craft language and answer the questions that are stopping this from moving forward. And uh, the member is Jody Nolan from Rochester Institute of Technology. And she's saying, Denise, that you can reach out to her. Um, they're open, opening a cybersecurity building in the fall with funds that were donated from a previous um, CEO, uh, Dados, and the previous CEO was Austin McCord, who was a Rochester Institute alumni. Um, so it's a comment, but um, Jody's offering her her. Um, expertise too to, to work with you if, if it helps. Oh my gosh, that would be awesome. I, I think that, um, you know, when I talk about this, some, some of the other challenges that we had with NFPA 72 is people are extremely brilliant and smart when it comes to fire alarm systems, but IT and cybersecurity is not their, their strong suit. And we need more experts like Jody in that to help in this in this goal. And I and and that's not that's not a fault of NFPA because they have been trying to bring in experts. And we do have cybersecurity in the NFPA um, or the Research Foundation also has cybersecurity going. So it's we're trying to keep it centralized, and so everybody gets on the same thing. When I talked about open architecture. That's really, and that's was one of the questions we're trying to get to, and that was where everything becomes interoperable. And so you can just run everything interoperably within that system. So that was, um, that's great to know, Jody. I'll be contacting you and see how we can get going from there on that. And another question came in in the meantime, and um, 
Anyone that has any other questions, just type them in the question box um, as soon as possible, and we'll we'll get to them. And if um, if we do, um, okay, let me go. This next one is: Will NFPA reference ANSI TIA 5017 and NFPA 1221? You know what? I'm gonna to have to look. I'll have to look into that, and um, I'll have to answer that one separately because I I don't have the references right off the top of my head. I believe 1221 is being addressed, but I don't know for certain. And I would rather be absolutely sure than to give out information that's inaccurate. Okay. All right. Then um, looking, and it looks like that's the end of the questions. Shall I give it a minute and just see if we get anything else? Go ahead, Denise. You can finish it up, and I just want to say thank you to everybody that um, that attended. Great job, Denise, and thank you to, to, to Denise. And go ahead, I'll let you finish. I'll be quiet. Thank you, everybody, for paying attention today for for our, <laughs> our webinar. It's been a pleasure. If you have a campus or a a uh, facility that's got multiple buildings and you want to connect all your fire alarms together, give me a call. Stay connected, stay safe. Bye. Bye, everybody, and thanks again.